The Bible says this in Exodus, the 14th chapter, Exodus, the 14th chapter, starting with verse 10, Exodus 14 and verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were what? Very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves, go on, to bring us out of Egypt. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should do what? Die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see Nah, I messed it up. You shall see again no more forever. Verse 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. I want to read these last two verses in the ghetto version, if you don't mind. It says in verse 14, the New Living Translation the Lord himself would fight for you, just stay calm. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Or why are you bothering me with this? Tell the people, get moving. I want to talk to you for the moments that we have left in the first part of our series from the, from the sermon title, Bust a Move us to move let us pray father in heaven we thank you god for the assurances of your word we pray that you will be with us as we open up your word to hear what it is you have to say to instruct us to change us and then to motivate us to be better father we ask now for your divine direction and for you to speak so that we can leave here different than the way we came and we'll be careful to give you the praise the honor and all the glory that will be due your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, born Harriet uh, Ross, uh, the life and story and times of the woman that most of us known, uh, have come to know as Harriet Tubman are well recorded throughout the volumes of scripted history. During the course of her influential life, historians estimate that Harriet Ross Tubman was responsible for liberating over 300 slaves from Chattel slavery and guiding them to freedom on the legendary Underground Railroad. Slaves from the South and slave owner alike began to call her Moses because they compared what she had done to the liberating of the slaves, uh, uh, to the biblical story of Moses and how he guided the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt. Just like Moses had successfully gone down to Egypt and through the power of God liberated Israel, so too did Harriet Ross Tubman, by the power of God, liberate slaves all throughout the South. Just like Moses had risked his life, uh, his own life and freedom by standing up to Pharaoh for people who at times were ungrateful, so too did Harriet Ross Tubman risk her own life and freedom on a number of occasions to save people whom she may not have even known or who too were ungrateful. As she traveled the Underground Railroad leading people to freedom, she had one simple rule on this trek. Where, whenever she would encounter someone who had a desire to taste the elusive joys of freedom, she would always let them know her one 
rule. It was something that to her was non-negotiable. Her one rule was that if you started on the journey, there'd be no turning back, no going back, no looking back. No wondering what could have been if you had stayed. She warned the slaves that started on the path to freedom that death only either by her hand or the hand of the slave masters chasing them would be their destiny if they decided they wanted to turn back. However, no matter how wonderful the idea of freedom is to those who have been held in bondage, there will always be some who will murmur and complain about their Moses. No matter in what circumstance those who start the freedom process will sometimes lose faith. They'll sometimes get to the point where they lose heart and get scared or get discouraged and want to turn back. And that's the issue that the biblical Moses is having in Exodus, the 14th chapter, starting round about verse 3. For 400 years, these Israelites had been in chattel slavery. Their bondage was over and their deliverance that they had hoped for and they prayed for and they uh, longed for had finally arrived and here God had led them out of, Israel, uh, out of Egypt and has led them to this place that they're about to taste their deliverance and their freedom. The Bible tells us here in, in chapter 14 that, 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 that the Lord gave instructions to Moses and he told the Israelites to, 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 to go in verse 2 to, to turn back uh, and, go into, and go into the cleft of the rock in between uh, Phil Haram, between Migdal and the sea. And the Bible tells us in verse uh, 3 of chapter 14, uh, then Pharaoh would think the Israelites are confused that they're trapped in the wilderness and once again verse 4 I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you then God says this to Moses I have planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army after this the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord so the Israelites camped there as they were told the Bible tells us they come out of Egypt and God has them between a place that has a mountain on one side, a marsh on the other side. The Red Sea is in front of them and behind them coming fast is Pharaoh in his chariots. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been where the Israelites find themselves in between a rock and a hard place, in between somewhere where you feel like you're being enclosed, where you feel like there's no, that there'll be no way out, where you feel like it would be impossible for you to turn to the right or to the left to go back or to go forward. You feel like you're stuck where there's no options for you you the Israelites find themselves in a place that God had that God has orchestrated for his glory they find themselves in a difficult situation where they have nowhere to turn and I would suggest to you that for some of us God wants us right there God wants us in a place where we've done all that we can where we've done all that we could possibly do, that we've exercised all of the options that we can do with our own hands and that we only have an opportunity or we only have a choice now that we've gotten ourselves into this situation or into this place that our only recourse for getting out of it is to lift up our heads and to lift up our hands and say, God, I've done all that I can do. Now I need you to get me out of this thing. Sometimes I think God wants us in a place where our only option is to run and to turn to him the Bible says that the wilderness is all around them and something that I, I found interesting here is that God sends the Israelites into this place that the, the, this marsh is on their right hand but on their left hand is this mountain that's called um, uh, Baal Zephron 
Now, if you were to take a look at the at the Hebrew, and this is just interesting to me. Of course, Baal is one of the one of the uh, major gods that the Israelites served, but uh, I'm sorry that the Egyptians served. But this this god Baal uh, Zephron, he he this mountain was the mountain of Baal Zephron, and and Baal Zephron, the word literally means he was the god of the sea. You see, this mountain that Israelites, the Israelites were camped in between uh, was, was, was a place that the Egyptians came to worship. And they came to worship this God that they believed controlled the sea that laid in front of the Israelites. This was the very God that they believed and prayed to for sustaining their crops. This was the very God that they believed and prayed to uh, even when the Nile had, had turned into blood. It was this, uh, this, this, this God, Baal Zephron, that they believed controlled the sea. And here is God. He gives the, Israel, he gives the Egyptians every advantage. He brings the Israelites to the, 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 the banks of the Red Sea uh, with the God of the sea, uh, the Egyptians' God of the sea on their left hand, a marsh on their, on their right hand, and the Egyptians behind them. And God gives the Egyptians every single advantage because God wanted to somehow get the glory out of this. The truth of the matter is many of us think that our circumstances are by happenstance or by accident. But our circumstances are not accidental. True, we may have taken a wrong turn somewhere and we may have done some, 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 some silly stuff from time to time. But, but God has oftentimes brought us to the place that he has for us for reasons beyond what you may be able to see at this point. Oftentimes we get so focused on the route that we wish we were on that we miss what God is doing or we miss where God is leading or we miss that sometimes God puts us into the midst of mess not so that we can get ourselves out but that we can get the glory so once he brings us out people are like oh my goodness how did she get through that? Oh my goodness, they, they said she was about to die and now she's walking around. What do you mean? They, they foreclosed two homes from her, but she's still, uh, she's still got money in the bank. Or uh, I don't understand how this person is still around and still surviving. Sometimes God takes us through some stuff because people would, tell, would, would then turn around and marvel at what we've been through. And they would say it wouldn't be by man's might or that person's might, but would, it's only by the grace of God that that person is where they are. Sometimes God orchestrates trouble just so he can show off his glory. I would think some of us, even if we would pray a little different in our lives, See, we always want to pray, uh, God, I want you to take this pain away. Or God, I want you to deliver me from this. How many of you all know that sometimes you can convince God to do things if you can convince him that he can get the glory out of it? How many times have we been by someone's bedside and, and, and didn't whisper, God, this person, the doctors said they only have two months to live, but God, if you would raise them up, Guess what? You can get glory out of this thing. I would suggest to you that sometimes if we tell God we'll give him the glory, God just may change his mind. See, most of us, we think we got ourselves out of issues. We think that sometimes it's our gifts or our abilities or our talents or our pulchritude that got us what we have. But if some of us would just step back and give God the glory... Bible says that the wilderness is around them and the Egyptians are behind them. And then the Bible says something very interesting. The Bible says this in verse 9. The Egyptians chased after them with all the forces of Pharaoh's army, all his horses, all his chariots, all his charioteers and his troops. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel as they camped beside the shore near Pharaoh, across from Baal Zephon. 
Verse 10 says, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. There's some interesting things that I see in this text, and I want to give you five things that sometimes block our path to destiny. I want to give you these five things. But what was so interesting and striking to me is that the Israelites somehow forgot, for some reason, that they were not visitors in the land of Egypt. Uh, um, many of us, we have this, this same problem, too. Anyone ever have their parents, uh, and some of you may be uh, uh, too young to have parents that would say these things to you, but uh, my parent, my mother used to always say these kinds, she, my mom had something called the good old days syndrome sometimes, where she would always want to tell us that we have it so good, but that her day was so much better, and what we go, like, she would say silly stuff like this. Um, when, when I was, a, when I was a, when I was a girl, I would, I would have to walk 10 miles to school. And I'd be like, okay, so what? What's up? They got, they, got, uh, they got planes, trains, and automobiles now, Ma. You know, we don't got to walk to school no more. They got these things called school buses now. But she would always act like there was something so great about it. She'd be like, well, you don't know how good you got it. I used to have to take a bucket and go to the outhouse and fight off snakes to use the bathroom. Well, that's good. I don't understand why you think that's so good. We'll take uh, toy running toilets and running water. But, but many of us, we have these ideas, these romanticisms about our past. We think somehow because God has now brought us through some things and over some things, we look back on the past and act like the past was actually so great. And I was saying to myself, how is it that, that, that people can hold on to such a romanticized view of the past and, and we think that uh, because we're no longer there anymore, we, we forget the pain and we forget the sorrow and we forget the difficulty. Well, here the Israelites are here out of bondage and they have a nerve to say that they would rather be back under the chattel whip of the Egyptians than to be free in the wilderness. The problem with most of us is we want God to deliver us from something, but we want to tell God where to put us. We want him to get us out, but then we don't like where God puts us once he brings us out. One of the challenges that I see, and let me give you these five things, and then let me go and sit down. Let me give you these five things, these roadblocks to, that prevent us from moving forward. The first thing is dwelling on the past. Dwelling on the past. We like to romanticize the past. I, I, I talked about that before I gave it to you. The next one here is discouragement. If you were to take a look at the text here, the people of Israel are on the brink of going into the promised land. This land that God has been promising them and their ancestors for decades, for years, for centuries. Here they are on the brink. But then there's some people in the camp that for some reason start murmuring and complaining. They begin to start saying, look, Moses, we told you, leave us in Egypt. Now, did you see anywhere in the Bible where they said, no, Moses, we don't want to go with you? If you go take a look at the previous chapters, these jokers are singing and dancing. Not now one of them said, leave us here. Not one of them. But here they are saying, Moses, we told you to leave us in Egypt. And the whole camp starts to believe it. One of the biggest roadblocks to helping us move forward is not just dwelling on our past. The past is there to teach us, but we're not supposed to live there. We're not supposed to dwell there. We're supposed to borrow from the information that we need from our present, but we can't dwell there. You with me? 
The next one is discouragement. If you have big dreams, let's just be honest. This is the new year, so I know some of you all set New Year's resolutions and you want to do things differently this year than you did last year. If you have big dreams, don't share your big dreams with small-minded people. Because the problem with small-minded people is they'll take your big dreams and they'll try their best to cut them down to a size that's more comfortable for their small-mindedness. Resist the urge to have the approval of others. Now, we all need support, don't we? We all need support. But everyone can't be in your corner cheering you along. Sometimes you have to close your ears to the cynics and the negative people and the dream catchers. Be careful of those that come along to discourage you. If God has given you a dream or if God has placed on you something that you should be doing for his glory, don't let people come and discourage you and rob you from that. That is nothing but the devil. Next I see in the text is this of, uh, this of distractions. Distractions. Bible says here in the text, verse 13, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The truth of the matter is God had proven to them over and over and over again that not only was he in charge, but that he could do exceedingly abundantly above whatever they even thought was possible. Mind you, these people have just seen the plagues in Egypt. They have just seen God lead them out with a man that went before Moses that couldn't even talk good. Because Moses, when he was on the mountain and God said, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses sat there stuttering so much. He said, Lord, how is it that I can go? I can't even talk that good. The Israelites have has seen God do all of these miraculous things, but somehow they began to get distracted. And many of us, the reason that we can't move forward uh, to, to, to the destiny that God has called us to is that we find it so easy to be distracted. What is it that you and I are supposed to be doing? What is it that God has uniquely called and created you to do? Once you find that out, get to doing it. But it's easy to get distracted when you don't have a clear purpose or a clear goal in mind. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorite books, Stephen Covey's um, uh, Seven High Habits of Highly Effective People, one, one of the principles is begin with the end in mind. And, and when you begin with the end in mind, if you know where you want to end up, it's easy to see the process as part of the journey. But the problem is, if you don't know where you're headed, the process then will get you to think that maybe the past was better. The process will get you to think that maybe this isn't going somewhere. But when you begin with the end in mind, it doesn't matter how rough the process gets. It doesn't matter how difficult the process gets. As long as you see in your mind the destination, you can deal with the difficulty of the process because you know where you're headed. Many of us, we get discouraged because we don't have an end in mind. See, the Israelites were so focused on the Egyptians behind them that they forgot the God who had brought them out in the first place. The next thing I see in the text is, is that of doubt. That of doubt. There, there is no doubt in my mind that there is power in positive self-talk. Positivity breeds positive results. Negativity produces negativity. You can't get positivity from negativity. But doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. See, it's normal when you attempt to climb a mountain that has never been climbed before to doubt whether you are someone who can accomplish something that no one has ever accomplished before you. That's normal. 
But the reality is, when we set our task or set our minds to do something, the reality is, even if we fail at what we set out to do, we at least try. But many of us, because we doubt ourselves or because we doubt our natural given ability or we even doubt that God cares enough about us to, 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 to push us or God cares enough about us to stay with us, many of us, we don't even try. You never have a chance of accomplishing what you desire to do if you don't try. The only people that are guaranteed to fail are those that never put their hand to the plow to try. Then the last thing that I see in the text, and you can tell them to come on, the last thing I see in the text is this idea of delaying moving forward. Delay. Delay. I love this part of the text, and, and for some reason, I, I, I always see this kind of stuff in the Bible. The Bible says... Uh, God told, the, but Moses told the people, verse 13, don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you. Today the Egyptians you see will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you, just stay calm. Now I could stay there, I could preach that, but that's not where I want to go. Verse 15 says this. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Bible says the, the, the Israelites are on the banks of the Red Sea and they are terrified. Mountains surrounding them, the sea in front of them, the Egyptians behind them. They don't know what in the world to do. Anxiety is at an all-time level. They're afraid. They're, they're nervous. They're despondent. They don't know why their leader has brought them to this place. And their leader tells them, don't worry. Don't be afraid. God is going to fight our battles. Chill out. Now, Moses tells them to chill. But apparently, Moses doesn't do what he tells other people to do. If you notice in your Bible, if your Bible breaks the text up into sections, this verse 15 is in a different section than verse 14. I imagine that Moses does what Moses always does. Remember when God sent Moses to deliver the people from Egypt and God said, look, Moses, get off the mountain. That's enough. Bye. Go do what I told you to do. Okay. Maybe you don't remember. That happened once. Okay. Here we are in verse, in verse 15. He tells the people, chill out, relax. And Moses apparently goes off on the side by himself. And he's laying his heart out to God. He's stressing. He's telling God, God, I don't know what to do. God, you had me bring these people out here. And God is saying, yo, Moses, you told them to chill. Now I'm telling you the same thing. Moses, chill out. Tell the people, get moving. Many times, many of us, we always want to push the date for us to start something off on the horizon. How many times have we done this? Man, when the new year comes, I'm going to start me this new diet. Or I need to... Lose some weight, Curtis. Uh, on January 21st, I'm going to start this diet plan. See, what we do is we delay and we set ourselves up for failure. If God is telling you to do something right now, you don't tell God, I'm going to do it on this day. You get going. You get moving. So many of us, we, we have ideas for businesses. We're saying, oh, God, I'm waiting for a sign from God before I can start this business. And look at God. God is doing to you what he did to Moses. God is saying, what are you talking about? All, all them years in business school and 
all them years saving your money and all them years working for other people to find out how the business works, what other sign do you need? Get going. Some of us, we have ideas of, of going back to school and we say, God, I'm just looking for a sign in order to do something. And God is saying, look, I understand you want uh, the heavens to open and a, and a voice to tell you. But while you are waiting on me, I'm waiting on you. And God is saying, if <laughs> you would take a step forward, I'll show you the way. <laughs> remember when re remember when Abraham sent his servant out to find a wife for his for his for his son Isaac and and and, and the servant was distressed and and the servant didn't know where to go and the Bible says as I was on the way God showed me where to go you missed it while he was going then God showed him the way to go many of us the way the reason we're stuck where we are is because we won't bust the move we're waiting for God to take the first step when the first step is ours to take it says in the text why are you crying out to me what you praying for Moses Tell the people, get moving. You see, this is a new year. And, and literally, when the King James says, tell the people, go forward, literally the text means, pull up your tent stakes. God is telling Moses, tell the people, pack up, let's go. Pack up, get moving. Some of us, we're waiting for things to happen. But for some, we have to make it happen. This is a new year. New opportunities. New challenges. And just like these Israelites, some of you have been camped out in the place of hurt feelings for far too long. It's time for us to stop waiting for someone else to apologize. And go on and move forward. Some of us have been camped out in this place of anger for far too long. Huh. We got to get moving. Some have been camped out in this place of depression and despondency for far too long. It's time to pull up the stakes and get moving in the flow of God. Some of us in this church have been content to just camp out and spectate. Not put our hand to the plow. Not help out. Now is time for us to get moving. Some of us are somehow waiting for everything to be all right. For the stars to align. For the heavenly chorus to open up the sky and speak to us directly but you know God has been telling you it's time to get your life together and you think somehow everything has to be perfect in order for you to give your life to Jesus but I think God is telling some of us that we have to take the first step in faith believing that if we would make a move God would then move some stuff out of the way that's been blocking us. If we would launch out and try something different, God will open up the way for us. If we would make a determination that we're not going to stay in the same place year after year after year, and we move, God will open up a way of escape. There's nothing that's impossible for our God. And here as the word progresses, God, even though he's protecting them with a cloud and a pillar of fire, the Bible says that Moses and the people of Israelites and the people of Israel, they begin to move. 
And as they begin to move, Moses, he touches uh, it, 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 Moses, as he begins to move, he, he, they, they touch the Red Sea, and the Bible tells us that the Red Sea parts, and they walk across on, on dry land, and that's not the most important part. The most important part is it took first a step of faith. It took first the determination in their heart that they're going to listen to the direction and the leading of God. And I believe that this year, as we utilize as our theme forward, as we move forward in the mission and the vision and the goal that God has for us, I believe that if you and I would put our hand to the plow, that if we would be intentional about making sure that we are not only in God's will, but once we know what God has called us uniquely to do, that we have the faith and the courage to step out and go and inherit the land that God has already foreordained for us. New Life, I know that there's so much that God has in this community for us to do. We've seen over and over again what the little that we do the impact that it makes in people's lives. Imagine if the rest of us joined the few of us, what our impact could be. Imagine if we all began to pull together. Imagine what would happen if we all put our hand to the plow to make new life a model of children's ministry what that would mean not only for us here but for our future and for our children it's my prayer that as we move forward this year that the unique plans we have as individuals the plans we have for our families the plans that we have for our lives for our jobs for our church it's my prayer that as a church as we move forward that we'll stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, but that we don't just wait, but we take the leap of faith to believe that what God has called us to, we already have. What God has placed before us, it is already ours. All we need to do is go forward.